Hello everyone, my name is Laura and today I'm going to present you with the fascinating world of heuristics. As many aren't probably aware of that, heuristics are what is an integral part of our everyday life. They influence our existence in a way that we don't even understand. Yet, of course, as I hope every one of you is going to learn something important from my presentation. But first, let me explain to you what heuristics are. According to American Psychological Association, a highly regarded institution, especially in the scientific world, heuristic in cognition is an experience-based strategy for solving a problem or making a decision that often provides an efficient means of finding an answer but cannot guarantee a correct outcome. In short, it is a mental shortcut that allows us to solve problems and make judgments quickly and efficiently. Now that we are over that part of my talk, I want to show you the link between the Youth on Trust Awards and this topic. It turns out that they are strictly connected indeed. Trust is very often what drives us to make a decision after all, and what manipulates the mechanisms in our brain are heuristics, little imposters that make it impossible for our mind to f be work free of any influence from the outside. And what I will focus on from now on are certain examples of the mind tricks we are fooled by on a daily basis. But before that, I want to mention a man who truly got me interested in the psychological part of human beings and encouraged me to dive into a broad world of heuristics especially. His name is Daniel Kahneman, and he's an Israeli-American psychologist and economist who also won the Nobel Prize in Economics in 2002. It was actually his book, Thinking Fast and Slow, that was crucial when it came to the choice of my presentation's topic for this competition. As we are already done with the basics of today's lecture, let me talk about the first of the three heuristics I find most suitable for the question, can we trust our intuition? It is called the halo effect. A catchy name, isn't it? However, when one hears its definition, the name doesn't bring such good associations as before, as it is a tendency to like or dislike everything about a person, including things you have not observed in them yet. And let me give you an example here. It is when we believe someone is more intelligent than they actually are because um, they're beautiful. It comes from something called uh, the first impression, but not only that. Let me evaluate it for a, on it for a moment. To remind one of the two important systems in our brain, system one, to be more objective, as unfortunately it is usually driven by impulses mostly, and so also not to make us jump into unfounded conclusions, Mr. Kahneman, mentioned previously, has come up with an abbreviation Viciati. What you see uh, is all there is. That is here to remind us not to lean on information based on impressions or intuitions, stay focused on the hard data uh, before us, and uh, lastly, combat overconfidence by basing our beliefs not on subjective feelings, but critical thinking. It is therefore important for us to increase clear thinking by giving doubt and ambiguity our everyday choices, and most importantly, the meaningful ones, and enlist the evaluative skills of System 2, that as well as System 1 is a part of the dual, pro dual processing model and its theory presenting how a thought can arise in two different ways um, uh, or as a result of two different processes. That's why we very often make reckless choices based only on what we see on TV, like, for instance, some political campaigns. Uh, very often not the best campaigns and the best candidates, as it turns out, after all. So remember, uh, impressions aren't all that matters. Very often one needs to take a deeper look into a topic and not just give it a quick glance. The second phenomenon uh, you're about to hear uh, from me right now is called the framing effect, or effects actually. Uh, and they are the ones that relate to how the context of a dilemma can influence our behavior. For example, we tend to avoid risk when a positive frame is presented and seek risk when a negative frame is presented. In one study, uh, when a late registration penalty was introduced, 93% uh, 
a percent of PhD students registered early, but the percentage declined to 67% when it was presented as a discount for er early registration. Or in a study of Tversky and Kahneman, also called the classical Asia disease problem, it turned out that people become conservative in a positive frame, but risky in a negative frame. In the number size framing effect, um, the change of the description also leads to a revision of decision making. As nothing changes in the problem from a rational point of view, the, uh, depending on whether the outcome, uh, are, outcomes are framed as gains or loses, participants give different judgments as they are more willing to take risks to avoid loses and tend to avoid risk associated with gains. With choosing members of the parliament, we too, as the citizens of one country, weigh out both the gains and the loses of our future choice of a set party representative. The last, but not the least important, are the reverses, so the tactics that involve advocating for a behavior that is different than the desired outcome. While it can be seen as a way of managing um, another person's behavior, it can also be used as a form of manipulation. For example, a parent might tell, tell their child not to pick up their toys in the room in the hope that the child will actually do the opposite. In relationships, um, people also use reverse psychology to get their partner um, to behave in particular ways by, for example, saying you watch, won't cheat on me, will you? Or you won't leave such a mess here, will you? The same tactics are very often used by politicians uh, trying to appeal to our emotional side and therefore make us decide on certain things they have in mind, which is usually voting for them. In conclusion, as you could see from the above examples, putting trust into something or someone isn't such an individualist, individualistic thing after all, um, like an impartial one. Uh, as it turns out, it depends on various factors that we don't even uh, usually consider influential on our lives. The truth is totally different and our decisions have never are not and will probably never be really an independently taken decision. As always, it will be a complex, tricky process that could cause a huge turn in our final thoughts about something more or less important in our existence. And psychology will only be one of the areas that will give us a more or less, again, satisfying answer uh, to the dilemma of trust on us, the youth and the other members of the society. And the last thing I would like to mention to you all is the answer to the main question of my presentation. Can we actually trust our intuition? I think you know the answer to that already. However, let me officially state the proper one. No, but the truth is that we very often do. Most of us, at least. An average person, let's say. All right? But we shouldn't actually do it every time we are to make a significant choice. And why shouldn't we do it? Because the decisions we make are biased which is not necessarily our fault, but a result of uh, too little usage of System 2 from the dual processing model in thinking. And that's how I would like to finish my presentation. Here are the sources I've used. The main one was uh, Daniel Kahneman's book, Thinking Fast and Slow, and the uh, American Psychological uh, Association Dictionary, also some psychological pages. Uh, thank you for your attention and I hope you enjoyed listening to me as much as I enjoyed preparing and presenting my findings with you.